thank you so much for joining me today. Um, can you tell me a little bit about who you are and about your career history? What did you study in college and where do you work now? Of course. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. I've been enjoying listening to your podcast. Awesome. Um, so I started, I would say, my career and one of my most exciting first things that I did um, was actually volunteering with AmeriCorps. And I volunteered in Spanish Harlem. Um, that's actually where I met my fiance. We were in the same school and we were working with underprivileged youth in a um, school there, just trying to kind of revive the district and the school and everything going on. Do you speak Spanish? Um, I was learning at the time. I've got to pick up Rosetta Stone and keep working on it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's something I think is really important to the field that I'm in. So I got to work on that. Um, but since then, I mean, I have been all over the place. I am really interested in helping anyone. I've never been one that's like, oh, homeless is my thing or foster care is my thing. It's just I want to help people and work with people and empower them. So I one of my other favorite positions was I was working with the Women's Prison Association and we did a women's empowerment group Um and we got to, you know, I taught them at that time. I was actually still a student, so I was learning about policy and how do you advocate in lobbying days. So I taught them to do that. And we went to the Capitol together, and it was really cool, especially just at that age to, you know, of course, you have some self-doubts. Like, I'm young. Why would they want to take a what class age was with this? me? Um, 22, okay. I think, at like 22. It was supposed to be just an internship where I was supporting um, the person that was leading it, but they were like, I'm busy and you've got this. So then I ended up doing it. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but Sometimes also, the best experiences yeah. are like when you're thrown into them. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Then that's been my entire career. I have only applied for one position. It's always been, I've been volunteering and then I became a position there and someone knew me and it was all like kind of just networking and a lot of me getting excited and saying I'll do things. So, so <laughs> what fills your day now? Um, my work day or all of my day? Yeah, like where do you where <laughs> okay. do you work? What so, what's your mm -hmm. title and all of that? Uh, I work at Berkshire Farm Center and Services for Youth. It's the full title. You can just call it Berkshire Farm. Um, we're a child welfare agency. I'm the director of foster care with them um, for almost about two years now. And there are six directors across the state because we are a statewide agency. So I cover sort of the capital region. Um, and just New York for, State. Of New York State, yes, yeah. New York State. Um, and for, in terms of kind of the entire agency, I work in foster care, but we do have preventative services, group homes, behavioral health services. It's all about keeping kids and their families in their community and serving them um, so they can live safely, productively, and independently in their home communities. And that's what I really love about this is that it is home community-based and keeping them in, like, growing and empowering communities and families. Cool, cool. So for those um, listening who don't know, like, who or what, like, Berkshire Farm offers, like, I know you mentioned you were, like, statewide, but, like, can you go into a little more detail about the organization and the specific areas that you cover? Definitely. Uh, so we started, I think, in 1886. I think I got that right. Um, as a farm in Canaan. Um, it was actually just a couple that owned a farm that wanted to serve um, boys in need in the community. And then that kind of started our sort of group home services. But from there... Um, foster care has really become the biggest thing, not bringing youth into necessarily a group home setting unless they really need it, and instead keeping them with foster families in their community, in their school district. Um, so foster care is one of our biggest, and then the other is prevention services. So that's helping youth before they have to go into foster care and trying to prevent that. So the whole thing is to keep families together. Um, we currently serve over 2,000 youth across New York State. We're one of the biggest, if not the biggest now, child welfare agencies for the state. Um, and we work with almost every single county because we want to be in the communities we're serving. We have offices everywhere. This is our biggest office that you're in right now. Most of them are these tiny satellite offices mm -hmm. that's just spread across the state, which, um, you know, allows us to actually be where we want to be working with people. Um, 
And we have that's over- so interesting yeah. that it was <laughs> it was started in like the 1800s. Yeah, I, yeah. When you first told me that, I was like, "Are you kidding me? Like that's so cool that this organization has been around for over a hundred years." Yeah, and just. I think the passion that started it is still the same. If you actually go on to our website, berkshirefarm.org, you can see um, all the original documents of the farm and all of that kind of history. But um, you can learn about the family and just it really is a very family oriented start to the agency and kind of and and very family oriented goals. Yeah, exactly. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. So what does a day in the life look like for the director of foster care good question (laughs) I don't think any day is similar at all Um, I guess the easiest way to answer it is to talk about maybe sort of my favorite pieces of the job and so therefore I do focus a lot of energy there and that becomes my job but my job is everything Um, but I really it's this is my first time getting to manage such a large team and um, I have always found that no matter what agency I'm in, what population I'm serving, that one of the most important things is that the frontline employees have what they need and they're supported and that they don't get jaded. There's so much turnover in this industry, especially child welfare specifically. And so it's being with my staff, um, being with the team, just checking in with them. I spend a lot of hours um, just going into the office and saying, how's it going? And then we end up talking for two hours um, about how's it going and projects and ideas and what we can do, which means I have to go home and work for five more hours on all the other stuff. But um, but that's what I enjoy. So I really, I want to, yeah, empower them and give them the tools they need. So can just to clarify, do you work directly with children or are you you overseeing those that work directly with children kind of can you kind of describe like the order of um you know personnel yeah definitely in their titles um, like what they do so I try whenever I can to get that child contact because I love it um but I don't often so the order I guess is um you have frontline workers as I call them but we have family specialists so those are kind of your caseworker position and we have home finders those are the ones who are serving our foster homes finding them training them engaging them and retaining them because being a foster parent is hard um and some community case aides and a few other sprinkled in there. But those are kind of the base positions that are in the field working with the kids. Um, and then they're overseen by program coordinators. Um, and they're assigned by county. So they'll have one or two counties. And then I oversee the program coordinators and oversee eight counties. Okay. Yeah. So how many program coordinators are here? Um, in this particular office... There are three foster care program coordinators. We're a big office, so we also have three prevention program coordinators. Um, and there's a different director who oversees prevention that I work cool. with. Yeah. I kind of just wanted to paint the picture for yeah. people listening that like kind of a, a day-to-day you mm-hmm. know, life for Gloria. <laughs> yeah, and currently we're in our visit room. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I know. So if you're watching this, this is where parents visit with mm-hmm. their children supervised with a caseworker is that it could be it depends on where they are in their case ultimately we want them to be with their kids without any supervision without any support um but at that point they're usually in their home so we would actually drop them off in their home for a few hours and come back so here it's typically supervised um but we try to you know kind of stay back and just let them hang hang out out with their kids yeah so i read an article that said if the goal of doing foster care is to adopt a child or children then you're not doing it for the right reasons so obviously there's extreme situations with children whose lives are in danger but if the goal of reunification with the bio parents is the the goal like how do you manage those expectations for foster parents So the certification process um, is 12 weeks, and we call this training a journey rather than a training because it really is about exploring every facet 
of your emotional self and where you are in life and where your family is, what resources you have, and then giving you example stories of the youth coming into your home and being like, okay, so this child comes in and this is their behaviors and here's what's happening. Okay, now it's two years down the line and they're going back to their birth family and we play out those kind of emotional stories. Um, And it's tough. I mean, a, a lot of people do come in with the idea to adopt and it's through this journey of MAP is the certification, this MAP journey, um, that we're able to get them to a different place or ultimately not. And they decide, you know what, foster care isn't the right thing. I think I would be too emotionally tied. And I respect those people as much as I respect the people who decide to continue because you got to be able to make the right decision. So I don't think it is for everyone. But I will say the inspiring piece is seeing people change and over time and their perspective. And then they realize they're in something bigger than themselves. It's not just a kid. It's a family and a community. And you're going to build that family and community. And we have some foster parents that are so dedicated where they're, you know, at first, because they don't know the birth parent, they're writing journals back and forth to them, sending pictures. Eventually they're meeting them. And then when they get reunified, they're going to the kids' birthday parties. They're still part of that life. So it doesn't have to be the end Mm -hmm. if um, you don't make it that way. Yeah. And I think it's important and I'm I'm confident that your organization does this, but it's important to, I guess, educate the foster parents not to look at the bio parents as like bad people or the enemy or like terrible parents or whatever. Like you're really working with people's, you know, lives, right? Yeah. I mean, we always say you're most people are one crisis away from being in a similar situation. Um, Things fall fast. And uh, so that's a lot of the stories we will give is, you know, you're reading the story about what seems like your stereotypical perfect family and everything's going well. And then the dad loses the job and then drinking and then this happens and you're in some place you never expected to be. And then we give the other example. Somebody like the kids you're serving doesn't get helped along the way and grows up in this strife and does is surrounded by people utilizing drugs and different things like that and then they're in that situation so just building the empathy from whatever line it is um is important because that empathy is going to help you when you are in love with this child that's in your home and you want that parent to be perfect right now but nobody's perfect Mm -hmm. and they're trying so yeah yeah that's important to like acknowledge um what can someone do if they don't necessarily feel like their calling is to become a foster parent, but they want to offer support to foster parents or what can someone do if like, that's not what they want to be? Yeah, that's a good question. We find a lot of them because we're in the community educating and engaging. Like think about someone listening right now who's like, Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I have kids. Like there's no way I could be a foster parent, but I want to do something. I want to be involved. Like what can that person do? Well, I got to have two answers for that because we have people with six kids that still become foster parents. (laughs) Um, So you could. And I don't want anybody to rule it out if they have the heart for it. Then come and talk about it um, and give us a call. Um, But obviously, go to our website, BerkshireFarm.org. And in there, it actually shows you. You can click on Join Our Mission. And you can join our mission in a variety of ways. Um, And it depends on what's right for you. So it's hard to say, but it can start with something as simple as, you know, donating to our mission fund, which goes towards um, youth being able to go to camps over the summer, buying a bike for a kid, uh, different things to support foster parents. Um, You could become part of our holiday angel program where we get presents for the youth. Um, You know, the foster parents get a stipend, but it's not quite enough. Um, It's just enough to kind of carry them over. So anything we could do to support them. But then also be friends with foster parents and help us get the word out there. Um, Foster parents are able to do what they do because they have a huge network of people who are willing to babysit. Who are So maybe you're not the one who is, but you spread the word and you find out, oh, wait, my sister would be a foster parent. Okay, let's give her a network and let's build that. Um, But mostly it's education. We have a lot of kids. We're always filling homes faster than we're opening them. And so... Spread the word for us. What about becoming like a care provider, like for babysitting or for Mm -hmm. respite? Could someone do that? 
So respite is a huge need. Um, you are becoming a certified foster parent to do respite. So it's the same process. Um, and what is respite? And respite is uh, basically providing for either a foster family or a preventative family, so the actual biological family, um, some needed respite, so some time away. So what that would mean is you'd be essentially in the care of these children from anywhere from typically it's a weekend but it could be up to 21 days you would of course agree to it ahead of time um and it's an invaluable service foster parents want to be foster parents but maybe you're listening to this and you realize like oh but what would i do when i go to mexico for two weeks every year or this or that and respite is the reason foster parents are able to do that in addition, when we're using preventative services and trying to keep these families together, they need to go to drug counseling or they just need to break away because their kids do have a lot of behaviors and they need to work on themselves. And you can provide that needed support by by watching the kids for a weekend. That's so important. Yeah. So important. Um, or babysitting even. Like I know mm-hmm. you don't have to become a foster parent to provide babysitting, but you can, I guess, go... That's what my mm-hmm. husband and I did. We became certified care providers so that we could babysit for our friends who have foster kids. And yeah. that's another way that you can support that. Yeah. I, I know that they really appreciate it. Um, Just to clarify, sure. when so it's through knowing somebody who is a foster parent that you become a cleared resource. So that's why I kind of go to that direction of know somebody, find a foster parent. Um, we do get calls being like, you know, I don't want to go through the whole certification, but, you know, can I just babysit for this person? And sometimes we've got some foster parents open to making new friends and then through them, but that's kind of the avenue, just so you know. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Um, Besides the physical people, foster parents, what else would you see is the greatest need in the foster care system? The greatest need? Um... A couple come to mind. I don't think I could say the greatest. Um, We need more support services always for the actual youth to process their situation. Um, And that is complicated and clinical. We have an amazing behavioral health department here that does that kind of work, but we always need more of it and more training for foster parents. If anybody does know a lot about trauma or um you know mental health services diagnoses to provide free training for our foster parents a little plug there would be great um but also other things that come to mind is uh teenagers are one of my most passionate areas because they often end up um not often but they may find no permanency in the sense that what we mean is that they choose a goal that's called APLA and they're choosing to just go off on their own um which you know for some youth is fine which Um, means like they're aging out of the foster they're aging out of the foster care system um and the statistics around kids aging out of the foster care system are not promising i'm the pregnancy rate goes through the roof the teen pregnancy rate and the recidivism so they're trying to uh, go back into care which is fine and we do support that um they also end up in prison all these different things um but ultimately everybody wants a resource in their life everybody needs one um and i think people are afraid of teenagers especially teenager boys so a lot of times the reason they don't find that connection is because we have a lot of foster parents who won't take in teenagers Um, so it does go back to needing foster parents, but we need foster parents that are willing to take teens, um, and supports for teenagers. So can you dispel some of the common myths that people may associate with foster care, like a million kids in the house and like crazy families, things like that? I would love to. Nanny McPhee, Um, like (laughs) that movie. I think that's what keeps them... Uh, so many foster parents away. So I would love to talk about that. Uh, the one you mentioned, it's this house full of 12 kids and an unfortunate, completely wrong myth that they're in it for the money or things of that sort is, um, one, not possible because of the process we go through and we make sure people are financially stable, but two, 
we don't suggest 12 kids in a house <laughs> um, and we won't allow it to happen. You're not allowed to have legally in New York State more than six kids anyway. Um, and it really six is only children. six foster children. And it's only that high because you could have a sibling group of six um, and we do try to keep siblings together. Um, we generally don't want to place more than two or three kids and one kid is ideal. If we could have enough foster homes where we just give you one child and you can put all your energy into them, I mean, that's what we would want to happen. That is like the most amazing thing I've ever heard because like the more families there are, the less, you know, crowded and the less like chaos it can be, like become a foster parent. That That's so true. You hit the nail right on the head. Yeah, they, and then other myths too. Um, I know people think they can't do it if they're single or just think that that's they don't have enough resources. It won't work even if they could do it. Or same-sex couples. Some of our same-sex couples, some of our best foster parents are single women, talking about women empowerment. They, I mean, honestly, marriage, not just marriage, but a relationship um, – often is what can get in the way. It's hard to be on the same page with this youth that's in your home that you don't know and all these behaviors come up. Um, so it is a lot of helping them through that relationship. So being single um, is great and empowering. You don't need a partner to foster. And we definitely have uh, several LGBTQ partnered um, relationships. Um, don't think you can't be it. <laughs> if you want to be a foster parent, don't worry about who else is or what they look like. Um, come talk to us because if you're calling us because you care, you're probably good and you probably can be a foster parent. You're qualified. Yeah. Cool. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's really good. What are some of the, like, give me some like really amazing stories that you, you've experienced as director here. And there's, there's a lot. And that's obviously what keeps us going. Um, I Yeah, I want to steal one of my program coordinators. This is one of the most passionate people I've ever met. And uh, she always talks about it being those tiny, tiny moments that make you cry. Um, so, of course, a reunification is amazing and adoption or what, any of that is beautiful. And we celebrate it. Um, but the ones that usually get you going, like an example she uses is that we had this young child that, would just not brush their teeth. And then one day the foster parent called up being like, he brushed his teeth. And you think that's so tiny, but like that, that made uh, her cry. And I'm thinking of like a specific teenager where the first time I met her couldn't list a single strength for herself. And then she just got adopted recently. Um, and she was just boasting about herself like a teenager should. Um, and that's amazing. So it's really, it is... It is those smaller moments, um, but they fill you with a lot of joy. They last for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're getting me right now, yeah. so that's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you say is the hardest part of your job? There, it's the hardest job I've ever had, um, and there's a lot of different reasons for it. But I think it would always go back to of course you could talk about you know having to work with multiple different systems and so many people and there's just a lot to sort of juggle but it is going back to the kids um and I would say what's freshest in my mind freshest in my mind is because it just was going on is when a youth comes into care and we are struggling to find a placement um and, and where do they go while they're looking there, for that's replacement. hopefully by the time because a lot of times we get the call and they haven't picked up the youth they know they're going to and by that time we're we figure it out and the car brings them right to where they need to go that's what we're trying to do so, so it's, it's a like quick emergency it's yeah it's a quick situation sometimes it's a it's planned and it you know you have a lot of time to plan for it and that's great but often it's not it's a little bit of an emergency um and so the the youth is ultimately it's the county who actually has these kids in care. And so the county workers are picking them up and they're bringing them to the local department of social services. And, you She's know, they try. Place. That's what I was going to say. They try. Some <laughs> of them got, you know, fresh paint on the walls and they have some toys and they try to do what they can do. But it feels it doesn't feel welcoming and it's scary and there is no real space for them. And they're just sitting there not knowing where they're supposed to go. 
And so, and then we're calling foster parents. And a lot of times, I mean, these are humans. So it just takes a while for them to answer their phone. You know, uh, they have things going on. But most of the time, it's because we can't find that right match, which is, again, why we need foster parents so badly is so that, you know, we can facilitate that quickly and they mm-hmm. don't have to wait. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you compartmentalize, like, and set boundaries about, the things that you learn on your job and like not bring that home. Like, cause I know that this is something that everybody struggles with in their own work and their career. So, but for you, I'm sure it's even more intense because you're dealing with children and people's lives, as you just said. So how do you do that? It's a learning process. <laughs> um, but I will say, especially in this field, you can't take it home, like legally. And so you do have to figure it out. And so that team dynamic is huge. I mean, I was here late, not because I had to be yesterday, but just because I was talking with one of my coworkers and we just kept talking and talking. And sometimes you got to process things out for a while and get it out of there before before you do go home. Um, and I will say Berkshire is really great at the little things we do at our last uh, forum, that's where all the leaders come together. We gave everybody a stack of affirmation cards and, you know, you pull one out and you read it to yourself every day. And we try to really emphasize, um, we have the sanctuary model, which emphasizes self-care. It's a trauma-informed model that we use here. So we definitely do a lot of things like that. But for me personally, it's definitely my team. My team is the reason I've stayed and the reason I get through it. So, so, question like are you hiring and if you are hiring like what kind of background does someone need if they want to apply to work here yeah we are um and you know depending on when you look there's different positions but uh we have a variety so for instance for the home finder position that's the one where you're working with the foster parent and supporting them finding them training them um we don't require a degree uh so that's exciting and it but gives they're us trained. they're trained obviously yes um mm-hmm. there's they go through extensive training before they're able to train foster parents but what we realize is the most important skill set is to engage and to have that sort of support and be able to be on the phone and be like oh let's talk about this with the foster parent for an hour um which there's just no degree that needs that. Um, so uh, all of our home fighters do happen to have mm-hmm. degrees. It's the, yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to have a degree for it's that. It's a skill I think that somebody just naturally has. Exactly. So that's why we, we don't want any restrictions. Um, we just ask for, you know, some prior experience working with youth. And again, like I say, we end up getting people with years and years of experience. We have two people right now who it's their retirement job and they have masters. So it's, a variety of people we get. Um, uh, so the other positions are regulated uh, by the state, and so you do need a bachelor's to be like the caseworker type positions, the family specialists, um, and then we require masters if you're any type of super level, supervisory level position. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, you already answered this, but like you say, like your team is what motivates you mm-hmm. to come back every day. Like what? What do you do to, besides your team, what do you do regularly to, like, boost yourself up and, like, prevent you from, like, losing hope when there's a a sad situation? Yeah. Um, Besides team is hard because it's a lot of the team. But (laughs) uh, the reason I'm in this work is twofold. I want to be able to empower my team, which I talked a lot about, and make sure they're not jaded. Um... But then I I am very creative and I like to solve problems. Um, so giving myself a problem to solve um, keeps me going and thinking creatively about how to make it easier and better and just sort of being solution oriented. So, for instance, we just started I just started a kinship care committee and that's a statewide committee um, in which we're sharing the challenges and successes with kinship. I guess I should define kinship. Um, So kinship, kinship care is foster care, but it's with someone the child already knows. So we typically think of it as a relative um, of some sort. But it also can be what's called fictive kin. So anybody who's had a prior relationship to this child, obviously a positive one. Um, And so that could be a neighbor, a teacher, a coach. And they're 
is a huge federal and statewide push, and Berkshire is really leading the way with kinship care. Um, but it's different. We're used to sort of these cookie cutter, you put them over here, they want these regulations, and then all of a sudden, instead, it's, oh, yeah, I know this kid, but I've got three kids and I never wanted another one, but I, of course I want to do this. And then, the, But they never agreed to have all these people in their home, and it's just such a different way of looking at it. So I really enjoy so, yeah, problem is, solving around that. What is that. the way yeah. of, of, what is your, like, push? What is your um, committee about? Um, so the idea is, well, it's a lot. Um, there is multiple issues you run into. So one, not even all, um, counties, courts, anybody, not everybody's on board with this yet. Uh, so whoever that person or group or agency is, we've got to get them on board. Um, there's this notion, you know, you've probably heard the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And uh, we need to dispel that myth. Um, mm. First of all, it's not only um, incorrect, but it's disempowering to the people you're serving Yeah. Um, to and say that their family and their resources are not. And if their family isn't, then why is this kid worth it? And we are a community-based organization, so we believe in the power of the people in the community. Um, so that's something that really gets me going is, building that cultural element and training and educating and showing that the outcomes actually are better for kids placed with someone they know rather than someone they don't know. Yeah, talk about um, that. Yeah, the research is outstanding. Um, this is how the federal push happened for this. Uh, compared to non-kin placements, kids in kinship care um, have, have better behavioral health outcomes. They have better... Um, school and academic achievements, better long-term permanency success, meaning they actually maintain whatever their permanency is. Um, and that's nearly double the chances for teenagers in care. Um, they're more likely to report feeling loved. That's the one I love the most. And it makes sense. How can you, you know, you feel like you're not part of something as much as a foster family tries to love you and support you. Um, they are like, oh no, this person came for me and knew me. So it's keeps them feeling special, which honestly, I think, is the beginning roots of all these other outcomes. If you feel loved, everything else comes with it. Um, so it's sharing things like that and getting people a little emotional and then being like, and yes, it's a little more challenging because we don't have our cookie cutter families, but that's not what we need and that's not empowering. Um, so yeah, fun stuff I like that. that. <laughs> So the month of May is Foster Care Awareness Month. So if anyone listening wants to get involved, but maybe they feel overwhelmed, what is the best way to start? What is something simple? Um, I mean, definitely the easiest way. I would say go to the website, berkshirefarm.org, um, and then right there you'll see Join Our Mission because it is so different what people want to do to get involved. Um and we always, across the state, as I said, we're everywhere. All of our offices do a little something for it. So you could also contact your local offices, which are all on there, and be part of our event or whatever it is that we're doing. I know here in Albany there's um, a little parade that goes on to raise awareness. Um, I don't know if they actually have the actual date yet. But uh, it's, it will know. be. It's, um, in it's in May. May. Yes, it's definitely in May. Um, uh, yeah, so that's in May. And, but the idea of Foster Care Awareness Month, and it was actually, the history of it's a little bit interesting. They weren't sure if they wanted it because there's a lot of confidentiality issues. And the reason foster care isn't talked about a lot is because you're not trying to identify kids in foster care. Um, however, we need foster parents. So not talking about it is a huge disjust disjustice. And the mindset is changing a little bit. Like, Kids in foster care don't need to be ashamed of being in foster care, so talk about it. Um, so talking about it with your kids, you know, it's just something you can do. Talking about it with your friends, just being like, hey, do you know anyone who's ever foster? There's um, Instant Family. If you haven't watched it, watch it and talk about it. Cute Hollywood movie, but it actually does the topic justice. Um, but it is about building awareness, so however you want to do that. Okay. What do you typically do for lunch? Um, lunch doesn't exist, <laughs> hence your podcast, <laughs> working this lunch. This is lunchtime right now, literally. Um, yes, uh, but 
Um, I steal the candy from Deb's bowl on her desk mm-hmm. as I walk back and forth. That's usually lunch. I don't think you're you really You're drinking, need so lunch. what are you drinking? I'm drinking tea. Okay. I do love my tea and yoga. I've got a yoga mat in my office, which is nice. Those mm-hmm. are things that keep me centered and rooted. But, what kind uh, of tea? Like what flavor? Um, hmm, what do I have right now? I think it's like a ginger peach one. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to have to try it again to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I'd like to pack lunches and if I do, I eat them. But I also feel mm-hmm. like when you're busy and you're motivated, mm-hmm. you don't really have to eat lunch. It's kind of like an American construct. <laughs> so work through it. Eat a big breakfast. Okay. Have fun at dinner. <laughs> um, I know you mentioned it several times, but how, where can people contact you? Um, yeah, so please go to our website, berkshirefarm.org. Um, you can, if you want to go specifically to the foster care page, say slash foster care. Um, but you can navigate through there, join our mission, look at our history and those documents I talked about. Um, you can also give us a call, but I got to pull out the phone number because I want to give you the general one and not just our office because you could be anywhere in New York State. Um, our general phone number is one 844 two seven five seven four seven three um so you could give that number a call all those numbers are also on our website so that's probably the easiest way to go we're also on facebook page and i'll link all of your information in our show notes so if anyone listening wants to link up and you're driving don't write this down just pay attention to the road just go to workinglunchpod.com later and there'll be a link to this episode where all of this information will be so Thank you so much. This was a little bit longer, but I think it was worth it just hearing your stories. Um, Yeah, thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing here and keep empowering me. That was the Director of Foster Care at Berkshire Farm Center and Services for Youth, Gloria Moran. Visit workinglunchpod.com for links, photos, and the video of our interview. We're always looking for more women who are killing it in their career, so if there's someone who you think we should feature as a guest, send us a DM on Instagram at workinglunchpod or email us at workinglunchpod at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening to Working Lunch and subscribing. We really appreciate the love and support. And remember, your biggest strength is who you are.